I'm going to start off telling you guys a joke, and uh, this is important because it ties into the message. A teacher asked her class what they knew about whales, and one little girl spoke up and said that in the Bible, Jonah was swallowed by a whale, and God saved him. The teacher smiled and said, that was impossible, because even though whales are big, their throats are not big enough to swallow a man. But the little girl was adamant, and she maintained that Jonah was swallowed by a whale. The teacher became impatient and reiterated that this was physically unlikely. But the little girl was unmoved, and she said that when she got to heaven, she would ask Jonah if he was really swallowed by a whale. And the teacher replied, but what if Jonah went to hell? And the little girl said, well, then you can ask him. And that'll come up later in our sermon. And I say that to say this, that hell is a real place. And eternity is a real place, right? Eternity is for real. And if I had to point to two events that happen in each person's life, is that one, death is inevitable, right? And number two, there is a real appointment in your life that is going to happen one day. And your iPhone does not have it on the calendar my iPhone doesn't have it on my calendar. We don't know the day or the hour. But the appointment is when you get to sit across the desk from the Lord. And this appointment has to go well for us. Because this appointment determines where we spend eternity forever. Okay? Now the reason we're talking about this is because we've been in a series that is called What is Church? And we've talked about the first week, I'll just tell you. The first week we laid the foundation of what is church. That the church is a community of people who each have a relationship with Jesus individually. The second week, we talked about that this group of people has the desire to do good works and live pure lives because of the relationship with Christ. Amen? Well, uh, third week, we talked about this group of people desires to participate as a part of the functioning body to make disciples in all nations. Amen? That includes Owensville, Missouri, right? As part of the functioning body, we want to make disciples inside our community, correct? And this week, I'm going to close this series. This is the fourth and final week of What is Church? Talking about this topic. That this group of people is the group that Jesus is returning for and that they will be with him forever. Forever. And forever is a really long time. So in order to understand the idea of forever, I brought an object lesson with me this morning. And some of you guys have seen this before because you've been around a while. And I've taught this, I don't know, probably twice a year because it's really important. But this here is a bull rope. I used this in the tree service industry years ago when we were doing tree work. And this has a 12,000 pound brake strength. So it's almost as strong as a chain. So that's kind of neat, right? But this rope, I want you guys to use your imagination here and understand that this rope goes over there. It goes down the hall out the back door of the church, and it's a very long rope. It goes around the world one, two, three times, and then this rope just shoots off into outer space forever. It's a never-ending rope. And this rope, my friends, is a timeline of your existence. It is how long you are alive for, forever. And our tendency in life is to focus on this little black part right here. And this little black part is our life on earth. This is our life from the time we were born to the time that we die on earth. And we spend a lot of our time focused on what we can have here that will make us really happy. Or maybe storing up treasures here for retirement to really focus on the end to be comfortable. And rarely do we think about eternity being real. And think about what will I be doing at this point in my life. Or where will I be at this point in my life? And when I first saw this illustration done, it put it in perspective for me to understand that all my life I had been focused on my business instead of the Father's business. And this illustration wrecked me for the rest of my life. I couldn't be, I, I couldn't be swayed by it. Because I realized that, like the Bible says, Jesus says, store up in heaven where moth and rust cannot destroy, instead of storing up on earth where moth and rust do destroy. 
So my ambitions had to change. And I want to talk to you guys about my testimony. And I'll spend a few minutes here. This is the testimony I wanted to share with you guys last week, but I ran out of time. And um, when I was 18, I graduated at Owensville High School and um, went to UMR for a college semester that summer. A program called Hit the Ground Running, where we're going to learn a bunch of engineering stuff before you show up at engineering school. Went through that program. Afterwards, that was a 30-day program. Afterwards, I had um, a one-month retreat in Kansas City at a, at a youth event. And then I had a, uh, another youth camp that we went to in St. Joe, Missouri, which was like a three-day event. I knew God had a calling on my life because he had been speaking to me in a real way when I was 18, 17 years old, going to church quite frequently. But I didn't quite know what it was. I didn't quite understand what it was. Like, you're searching, trying to find out, God, what is my calling in life? What, am I, what is my purpose? What am I supposed to do? I go to this youth camp in Kansas City, and I can remember this person praying over me and said, hey, I want you to know that God's speaking to me and said that you are called to be a leader. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. You know, great. Go to St. Joe, Missouri, and this little old lady, I go up to the front for prayer that, that morning, I remember this, this little old lady, she was frail, she was older, and she laid her hand on me, and I remember her praying, her words were this, you are called to be a leader, and I was like, holy cow, you know, two times in a row, and she said specifically, you're called to be a leader within your church, and I was like, okay, cool, so now I'm set to go to college at UMR in Rala. I'm already enrolled. My classes are laid out. They got the whole itinerary for the semester, doing like 19 credit hours. And God started to deal with me and said, I don't want you to go there. I want you to go here. And he wanted me to go to Bible college. And I was like, that's funny, Lord, because I've got my own plan, <laughs> right? I've got my own plan. And what happened was I told God, I said, here's the deal. I said, I'll go to a two-year college and get a two-year degree. And afterwards, I will begin to pursue your calling on my life. Because if your plan fails, God, I need to have a degree to fall back on. How many of us know that God's plans don't fail? That's why I'm here today, teaching. And what happened was I went to um, Lynn State Technical College for two years. And not really falling away from the faith, but just stepped out of my calling. I wasn't pursuing it, wasn't doing a lot of Bible study, wasn't plugged into church as much. Still read my Bible and stuff like that. But after going to Lynn State, I got my degree for architectural design and drafting instead of being an architectural engineer. Now I've got this degree. Get out of college. Meet my wife. We're together for a few months. And now we start looking for a church around here. We lived in a little apartment in, the, in Main Street, Owensville, above the hair salon there. It was small, like 400 square feet. And uh, utility bills were still like 500 bucks a month. I didn't get it. I was like, man, Owensville's utilities are high. Uh, but anyways, we're living in this little apartment. We're starting to look for a church around here. We're visiting multiple churches. And um, mind you, I haven't had this direct moment from the Lord for years now, because that was the beginning of high school. We've been married for six months, not even six months, three months. So this has been two and a half years. We go to a church in Gerald. It was, I think it was the Gerald Pentecostal Church. And I remember this. I'm sitting in the back, um, kind of like where my dad's at, in the very back of the church back there. And at the end of the service, it's a really excited environment, right, because it's a Pentecostal church. And uh, I'm standing in the back, and this guy who's preaching that day was the youth pastor of the church. He was probably a 40-year-old individual. I don't recognize any of these people at all. Never met them before in my life. And this guy gets off the stage. He's praying for some people up here in the front. And he makes eye contact with me in the back. And I'm like this. <laughs> you know, like, what in the world? And that guy, after, after he finished praying for the person, he marched straight back there and he tapped me on the shoulder. And he goes, can I pray with you? And I was like, sure, man, have at it, you know. And I will never forget what he said. He said, I want you to know that whatever God has been calling you to do, I want you to dive in head first. And I was like, okay. And I knew this is God talking to me from back then. Like, I called you to go to Bible college. And I'm like, okay, cool. You know, and I'm stubborn. If you guys know me, I'm stubborn. I didn't listen. I'm, like, talking to Ashley on the drive home. Like, that guy prayed with me and said, I just need to dive into my calling head first. And um, we go home, spend the week doing normal work activities. And we go back to this church the following week. And there is a different guy who's preaching that week. Never met him before in my life. And again, I'm sitting back there in the same seat where my dad's at. And this guy is up here praying with people at the front of the church. 
makes eye contact with me, marches to the back, and almost verbatim tells me the exact same words. He says, whatever God is telling you to do, I want you to jump in with both feet. And I was like, golly. You know, so here I am, three months into marriage, and I'm telling my wife we're going to move from Owensville to Kansas City and go to Bible college. So we made that plunge, right? We go to Bible college, and I failed, and this is why. Went there for a year, and then business opportunity hit, and I was led by opportunity instead of being led by God. I, led, I let this business opportunity lead me back home, away from Bible college. I come home, pursue business, and again, I'm doing my business instead of the Father's business. Now, I'm telling this to you guys because last week I talked about, hey, we find our place in the body, whether we're a hand or a foot or a mouth. And I don't want you to be like me where it took 15 years for God to turn me over and be like, I have direction for your life. I have direction for your life. Like I've been saying the past two weeks, he stands at the door and knocks, waiting for his kids to open the door and let him in. So here we are um, at Bible College, come home, do business, do business for six years, seven years, I forget how long it's been. We find ourselves at Grace City Church in Bourbon, and I start going there. Me and Ashley go there for about a year. My brother Stefan invites me to become part of the staff there and just help out with whatever activities they, they need. You know, if a, if a children's church leader can't show up that day, I go sub for that. Or if they needed somebody to preach here, I'll preach there. And that was a stretch for me. I never preached before in my life. And I would do that. And I'll be honest, guys, I'm young in this whole idea of preaching. I think I've got 22 messages under my belt. And that's it. So, you know... I don't know. I don't know why I talk so long if I'm that young in the faith. But anyways, uh, that's besides the point. So anyways, here I am at Grace City Church, and I can remember I've always been really devoted ever since Bible college. What Bible college taught me, the number one lesson was that your life with God will depend on your discipline before God. Your life with God will depend on your discipline that you had before God. And what I mean by that is, how often do you get on your knees and shut the door behind you and just talk to him and pray with him and get into the word and listen to what he has to say to us? And I remember in Bible college, Corey Russell, he was one of our Bible college teachers, he said, this is how important it is for you to spend time with God every day. He said, you go to the coffee shop, you buy two coffees, one you drink and the other one you pour over your head. He said, wake up. He's like, it's 6 a.m. He's like, I don't care what time it is. He said, wake up and get into your prayer closet and get to know the Father. So all through my life now, I've been devoted somewhat. Like, I try to do it at least every day. Sometimes it's only 80%. You know, if I, if I can be with him 80% of the week, I feel like I'm doing well. And I'll get in my, in my closet, in my office, and just spend time with him. So one morning, I'm in my prayer closet at the house, and I'm just reading through the word, and I feel God speaking to me saying, there is more for you to do in this church. There is more for you to do in your church. And I was like, okay. And I, I've got tears in my eyes because the Lord had, was profound in how he delivered this. And I go upstairs, and I talk to Ashley, and I said, God's got more for us to do within this church. This is a Wednesday morning. I go to the staff meeting. It's at 930 on Wednesday mornings. You'll have to forgive me for drinking so much water. I've got a sore throat this morning. <laughs> I go to the staff meeting, we're halfway through the meeting, and Kenny, Pastor Kenny, our lead pastor who was here two weeks ago, he said, guys, I feel a calling in my heart, a tug, to either start a church in Owensville or Steelville, and this is what I want to do, our next step, to launch more gray cities. And I said, Kenny, I said, God was speaking to me this morning that if you want to start a church in Owensville, I'll help. I'm your guy. I'll help lead it, help facilitate all of that stuff. And God had taken me from a place of just pursuing my business to understand that my business doesn't matter because life is so temporary. The Bible tells us that our life is but a vapor, but eternity, you guys, is forever. So I changed the ambitions. I changed the ambitions and I said, you know what? It was three months later in my landscaping business, I had sold it. I sold the landscaping business and I committed to this call that God had for me to help plant this church here. And then COVID happened. <laughs> and I sold my business, and now we're not starting a church. And I'm like, all right, I'm really lost here now. And through the, 
through the last three years, you know, it's just been like doing what I, I, I've been doing. A buddy of mine helped me get started in a different business, and we've been pursuing that, and that has gone well. And now here we are, finally. And I, I feel like I'm finally here, like I'm finally stepping into my calling that God has been trying to prepare me for forever. And the lesson behind this testimony, how many of you guys know that the Bible says there is power in the testimony? I tell you guys this because there is power in one man's story because it can relate so much to the next guy sitting in the seat right here. And that you know that God has called you to something, some form or fashion in your life to serve him, to do something for him. And I can't tell you what that is, but he can and his Holy Spirit will because he is alive and active. All right, so that was just the testimony that I wanted to share last week and I didn't. So now we can start the message. <laughs> Um, I want to talk about two things here. One, the first item is a little scary. The eternal destination of the world is on one hand, and the eternal destination of the church is on the other. And we're talking about a forever place, right? And I heard a message this week by Paul Washer, and he described God's condition right now to the world is this. And it set well with me. I was very impressed by this. But he said that God right now, in his kindness, is in heaven. And with a hand of mercy, he holds back his wrath that is due on the world ever since the fall that Adam and Eve had. And he's holding back his wrath with a hand of mercy because of his kindness. And with his other hand, he extends grace to the world right now. And he's saying, come to me. All you who are weary and burdened and broken, and I will give you rest. I knock on the door. Would you come and dine with me? And he's extending this hand of grace to creation, to us as humankind, saying, Come, come, come. The time is now. The time is now. Because one day, the hand of mercy and the hand of grace is going to do this. And it's going to do this. And we meet this moment in the Bible that is terrifying. It is so terrifying that earth and sky flee from the presence of the almighty creator God that created the earth and the sky. Watch what is said here. This is in Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15. And if you don't know, I'm going to tell you real quick. Revelation was written by John. John the Beloved. He was a disciple, one of the apostles that walked with Jesus. And he's on the island of Patmos. He was the only disciple that wasn't like martyred, right? Peter, crucified upside down. John, thrown on an island and said, we're just going to put you here because we don't want your message spread to the world anymore. John is on the island of Patmos and he writes the book of Revelation under the influence of God speaking in his life. As a matter of fact, the beginning three chapters of Revelation are written with red ink because the Spirit of Christ is speaking through John. And we're going to get to that part in a minute, Revelation 2 and 3, the preparation of the church. But right now, I want to read on the future of the world. It says, I saw a great white throne and him who is seated on it. Seated on it. John is seeing a vision. He says, the earth and the heavens fled from his presence because they realize that there is this moment in time where God seems terrifying and his wrath is going to come out upon the world and this is a real event guys how many of us know that the Bible is truth and I am nervous this morning to preach this because it is not a happy-go-lucky message it is not a popular message but I want to be a man a person who's going to preach the entirety of the Bible and not just the fluff amen it says that earth and heavens fled from his presence and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, and they stood before the throne. And books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done as recorded in these books. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it. And death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. And the lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown 
into the fire. And guys, this is a scary verse for me. Because I realize that when Jesus is teaching the story of the vine and the branches, and he says, those branches that are in me that do not bear fruit, I will prune them off, and I will set them aside. And he bundles up the dead branches eventually, and he throws them into the fire. And this is that moment that Jesus is speaking about. It's a scary thought when we think about Matthew chapter 7, and Jesus is teaching again, and he says, the way to destruction is broad, the gate is wide, and many find it. And yet he says that the way to life is a narrow road, and a few find it. And how many want to be a part of the few? Amen? How many want to be a part of the few that make it to that place? And we see the correction that he offers to us as his saints in Revelation 2 and 3. And this is so good, you guys. Because Jesus sees the end. He knows the end. And then he gives us the end of the story so that we know that we can prepare to be the church that he's called us to be. And this is what happens. He tells us the eternal destination of the church. And before we go to Revelation 2 and 3, I want to talk about the paradise of God. And this is the destination of the church forever, according to this rope. Forever. And if you want to see what that looks like, I want to give us a homework assignment. When you go home, I want you to read Genesis chapters 1 and 2. And then I want you to read Revelation chapter 21 and 22. And this is the beginning of the paradise and the end of the paradise. And these four chapters give us an inside view of what it will look like for eternity with him. And it is so good, you guys. I would challenge you to read that. So here we go. Jesus tells John in Revelation 1.19, he says, I want you to write, therefore, what you have seen. What you have seen, John, in the vision. What is taking place now on earth and what will take place later. So what is happening right now on earth is Revelation chapter 2 and 3. And it's seven churches that have been planted by Paul. And what happens is Jesus actually offers them all instruction, some discipline. And he often, if you read all of the seven churches, he gives them a compliment sandwich. He says, hey church, you're doing this part of your life really, really well. And I love to see that you guys are ministering in this way really, really well. But the next part he says, if you could straighten this up for me, do that. Because I want you to be victorious for the end. I want you to be victorious for the end because I want you to be with me forever. And I want us to go through the seven churches because I believe they can relate to us individually. And this is what this is what says what is this is what is said. I have often read this myself and I've identified in my own life how I might be struggling with this part or this church and I can see that evident in my own life. And I ask God to help me. Say, "Lord, would you help me prune that out of my life so I can be the church that you've called me to be?" So let's start here. In these passages, he's going to offer correction, advice, and encouragement. And you guys, there's no way that I can read all of Revelation 2 and 3 because we would use up so much time, so I'm going to paraphrase what is said. First of all, he offers correction to the church of Ephesus. He says, this church has forsaken their first love. He says, you have forsaken your first love, so I ask that you would repent and do the things that you did at first. And this is important because how many know that we can actually be a part of a church and yet not be doing what we're supposed to be doing with our lives? He says right here, he says that if you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand. See, it's easy for us to get into a situation in our lives where we play church and we show up on Sunday morning, but when we go back to our daily life, there's no communion with the Father. And I don't want to be a body. I don't want to be a person myself that just plays church. I don't want to fall in love with Jesus one day when I was 18 or 19 years old. And then five years later lose the fervency and the desire that I have for him. And then just forsake my first love and just walk in lukewarmness. Like the church of Laodicea does. So the church of Pergamum is actually struggling with teaching false doctrine and they're struggling with idolatry. The same thing as the church of Thyatira. 
They are tolerating sexual immorality within their body and idolatry. So two points right here. What is sexual immorality and what is idolatry? And how does it apply to us today? Sexual immorality is a simple definition. Any sexual activity outside of a marriage between a man and a woman. Idolatry can be this. Idolatry is for us any priority that becomes before your relationship with God. My idolatry in my own life has oftentimes been my business. I would put my business first and I'd spend more time working than I would spending time with my family or with the Lord and that my main ambition was my bank account and my business instead of his business. We can make idols out of money. We can make idols out of our career. We can make idols out of our, our kids. We can make idols out of education and pursuing a certain degree. And we can elevate these things in our life to where they are the dominant priority in our life. And our priority before the Father is way down here. And in all seriousness, our priorities should stack out like this. God, our spouse, our kids, and then our ministry. God, our spouse, and then our kids, and then our ministry. And like my career can come somewhere down here. Amen? We need to watch our priorities in life, church, and make sure that we are making the main thing the main thing. So the church of Sardis, this is a hard one. He says, you are a dead church. Even though you have a reputation of being alive, he says that you are dead. This is a group of people who are meeting regularly, and yet they are not bearing any fruit. Remember this, that Jesus says that you shall know the people by their fruit. And we need to be a body, a people group, that bear fruit for him, producing good fruit. The church of Laodicea, this one is my favorite. I love this. He says this. He says, church, this church, you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. He is offering them a chance of repentance. He is offering them a chance to come back to him. And advice is offered with each church that he is talking to in Revelation 2 and 3. He offers this advice. He says, behold, I am coming soon. I ask you to wake up, church. Hold on to what you have. Be sincere and repent. And then he says this, Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now real quick, if you have ears in this room, raise your hand. That should be every hand. We all got two ears, right? This message is for everyone. He wants us to know that these messages of correction and advice and encouragement is for everyone. Because every point of these churches in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, we've probably been in a place where we have forsaken our first love. We have probably been in a place where we have been lukewarm. We have probably been in a place sometime in our life where we idolize our education or our career or our bank account more than we idolized God. Amen? And these are the ways that Jesus loves his church so much, giving us advice in the beginning of Revelation, saying, here it is, church, these are the areas I want you to address so that at the end of Revelation chapter 21 and 22, you can be with me forever. And he wants us to realize now and address the issues now so that it will not be too late, so that we will not be the group that is on the wide road. Amen? So then he gives us this. He gives encouragement to each church individually. And he says, I want you to be victorious. And I will give you the right to sit with me on my throne. He says, to the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Now this is a cool statement. Because if you read Genesis 1 and 2, you will see that the tree of life exists there. You guys remember that? First, you have the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that Adam and Eve ate from. And then you see this tree, which is the tree of life. And if you eat from it, you gain eternal life. This tree shows up again in Revelation 21 and 22. And this tree stands by a river. And it says that this tree, if you eat from it, is for the healing of the nations. Because God is bringing a new heaven and a new earth 
one day for his people, for his children, and for his saints. Amen? Now, he says, to the one who is victorious, they will be dressed in white, and they will walk with me. So I want to encourage you today, church, to be victorious over your sin. To be victorious in the area that God has called you to in your life. Be victorious in your calling. To be victorious over fear. To be victorious over anxiety. To be victorious over addiction. Be victorious in your life and you will gain eternal life forever. This is the calling for the saint. This is the hope that he has given us. The calling in Ephesians 1 where he says, I wish that the eyes of your heart would be enlightened so that you can see your inher his inheritance in you. Do we have any idea how valuable you are? That he ransomed his life for you. How valuable you are. You are his inheritance. And this brings me to my last point. The assurance of salvation and knowing him. Knowing that right now God is holding back wrath with one hand. The hand of mercy. And extending a hand of grace to us right now saying, come to me. Come. And he demonstrates his love for us in this. Now this is profound. While we are still sinners... While we are broken, while we are dirty in our sin, while we have addictions, while we are struggling in marriage or struggling in relationships, He died for us. Even while we were struggling. He saw us in that state of brokenness, that state of despair, that state of unrighteousness, and He went to the cross anyways. Because He loved you. And He loved me. It says Christ died for us. And since now we have been justified by his blood, how much more, saints, shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? How much more? Because when he died, his blood covered us. And that blood is what justifies us. So that when you stand before that courtroom, and that appointment becomes real in your life, and you sit across the desk from him, the only thing that the Father sees is the blood of His Son over you. Hallelujah. The assurance of salvation is real. That when you were dead, this is Colossians 2, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of our flesh, God made us alive with Christ. Hallelujah. This is something to rejoice about, folks. This is something to say, thank you, Lord, for seeing me and coming to rescue me and putting yourself on that tree. I want to invite the worship team up. We're going to get ready to close. So he forgave us of all of our sins. He canceled the charge of our legal debt. He canceled the charge where when you stood, when you stand before that courtroom judge and there's a charge brought before you, he says, nope, that paper, that document has been canceled. He took that and he nailed it to the cross for you. He nailed it to the cross for me. Because of his inheritance, wanting to be with you forever. Forever. And I'm going to close with this. But the definition of church is a community of people who each have a relationship with Jesus. Individually. That means that we make time in our daily life to spend time with the Father. That means that we read our word. It means we're praying to him. We're speaking to him. It means we get involved in fellowship. It means we might lead a small group at our house. Whatever that looks like for you. We want to produce a relationship of making disciples in our community, right? This group of people has the desire to do good works and live pure lives because they're living for him. Amen? We are living for him, striving. Paul says it this way. He says, I am straining towards the goal. Straining is like this, guys. When we're, when we're working out with weights, and you're pushing weights up over your head, and you're like, ah, straining. We are straining towards the goal. 
that even though it may be difficult, even though we have to work to put our flesh to death, we choose to live by the Spirit, and we choose to pursue Him, and we strain towards the goal. That means that even if your calling is outside of your comfort zone, you step into that. Because who He equips, who He calls, He equips. Amen? And wherever God has called you to go, whatever God has called you to do, He will meet you there. He will equip you there. This group of people desires to participate as part of the functioning body to make disciples of all nations, including this community right here in Gasconade County. This people group, this community of people is the group that Jesus is returning for and they, church, will be with him forever. Amen. This is why Jesus says, In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again. Hallelujah. I will come again. And I will take you to myself that where I am, you may be also. The eternal destiny of you and I. So that guy who delivered that package this week at the house before he left, he looked me in the eye and said, I'm not going to see you again until eternity. And I was like, that's right, brother. I said, what's your name? And he gave me his business card. And I said, I'll see you soon. And I'll probably never see that guy again. But the moment we had in the garage was profound because God spoke to me through him. And it just makes you realize how real God is and how he loves his kids. And one day he's coming back for all of us. All right, let's pray. Father God, we just thank you, Lord. We thank you for the assurance that we have in your blood. The work that you did on the cross has already been done. All we have to do is receive that. God, as we go into this time of communion, let us examine our minds and our hearts before you, God. Whatever is wrong, let us set it right, Father God. I ask that you bring conviction, Lord, to areas of our life that need conviction, that you bring con encouragement to the areas that need encouragement, God. We cast out all fear. We cast out all anxiety in this place this morning, and we invite your presence here, Lord. We praise you, Lord. We give you all the honor and all the glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.